guys. Welcome back to another edition of Chats from the Blog Cabin. Today, I'm joined by vegan cook chef. Last night, we had Simone from Cecil who gave us a whole online cooking class. But today, Kathy's going to join us and talk about some vegan options. But before we get to Kathy, I want to share a quote by Eleanor Roosevelt since it is Women's History Month. And it says, a woman is like a tea bag. You can't tell how strong she is until you put her in hot water. And I thought since it's kind of vegan and we're talking about cooking tea bags, it kind of would apply today. So, Kathy, welcome to the show. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, and thank you so much. First, I have to say that intro is amazing. So, yay you. That Just kudos. Um I um, am the blogger at plantbasedinstantpot.com, healthyslowcooking.com, and I'm the author of 10 traditionally published vegan cookbooks. So that's it in a small nutshell. But I, I try to make recipes that are real inclusive. So um, my wife wasn't plant-based till last year. We've been together 15 years. So um, I'm used to making food that's like really flavorful, that you're not really missing something, you're enjoying what's there. And I also work with people who have different allergies or dietary limitations. So um, if anybody in your audience has a question about how to substitute something maybe that they don't have or they can't have gluten, like I can't have gluten or something like that, please reach out to me. I'm happy to help you. So where did, why did you start your journey of doing vegan and gluten-free um, cooking? Yeah, I always say it's vegan by choice, gluten-free by doctor's orders. <laughs> okay. It was not a happy choice and it made me very sad for a while. <laughs> um, but I actually became vegetarian in 1983, back in the old day. So when I was 18, I tells you, I'm 55 now. Um, and in 1983, you couldn't go to the grocery store like you can now and get tofu and, you know, tempeh and vegan and vegetarian entrees. None of that existed. I remember when the first vegan hot dog came out. It may, or, it was probably vegetarian then. It made us all just like scream with excitement. <laughs> um, for me, it started out from being more of, um, I hate to use the word moral, but it came from a feeling animal kindness side. Because um, uh, there are three ways people typically come to veganism. One is through um, kind of this moral animal not wanting to hurt anything place. Another is usually called plant-based. And that is actually from more of a health standpoint. Maybe your doctor said your cholesterol's high. You need to cut down on dairy or something like that. And lately there's a much more um, uptake in people who are becoming vegan for environmental reasons. So there's no one reason. And if anybody tells you that there's one right reason, they're wrong. Whatever reason you have is the right reason for you. And even if you're just wanting to, to dabble like Meatless Monday, or maybe you're trying to add some more vegetables, um, there are some not nice vegans out there and those are the ones you hear the most about. I would not be that one. <laughs> <laughs> I like to be really inclusive and um, someone actually said I have a Facebook group called Vegan Recipes Cooking with Kathy Hester. It's a free group if anybody wants to join. Um, but I have plant-based people, vegans, and vegans and plant-based people like to fight it out. You know, anybody who thinks differently these days likes to duke it out a little bit and environmental people. But I did a survey and there are people who still are on the standard American diet but they're welcomed in and they still get new recipe ideas. And, you know, I hate to put it this way, but in a way, you know, if you eat meatless one less time a week, you're probably a little healthier and I'm happy. And then I'm teaching you something new. So, um, so I had been leaning that way in hindsight for a long time. Like, I would eat the beef out of my noodles so I could have my noodles the way I wanted them, which was without the beef, mm. you know? So, I mean, if you look back, it's very interesting to see that. But um, the day I went vegetarian, I saw a side of beef on a hook and 
I'm a child of the 70s. So everything was in styrofoam. You didn't connect it with the living, breathing animal. And mm -hmm. again, I'm not trying to tell you or any of your audience that that's the way you should think. I'm just kind of communicating my way. Um, and that was it. And so I've probably been vegan now for about 10 years. So I actually was doing a vegetarian blog and got a lot of vegan followers. So I, I and I just love to tweak recipes to make them work for people. That's kind of my passion. And then um, I wanted to write a vegan slow cooker book and I didn't. So I started a new blog, healthyslowcooking.com, which exists now. And it's not only slow cooking. Um, and a publisher found me two months after I wrote, started the blog. And so as I was writing that book was when my transition happened. Wow. I mean, when you, were you always one that wanted to tweak recipes, even when you were growing up, wanting to make a recipe different? Or was that yeah. something you kind of fell into? I've always been kind of experimental. What's interesting, because I have lots of friends that are like old Southern cookbook authors. I don't know if you know, like Nancy McDermott or Virginia Willis, and they're just wonderful, amazing people that learned how to cook at their grandma's knee and all that. And we were all packets and Pillsbury you know, pop mm -hmm. open biscuits and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, but we would make fried chicken and then I would go into the spice cabinet, bring everything out and make the mix. And so it became my job. And now one of the things, one of the techniques, and you can use this no matter what kind of cooking you use to add more spices and be more adventurous is smelling things. So I do a lot of smelling. So if I had a pot of chili right here and I was like, this isn't quite right. And I was like, hmm, do I think that more cumin would be good? Or I should put cumin in. If you take it and hold the spice jar and smell them both together, you will get a definite yes or no, like the magic eight ball in your nose. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I've never heard cooking be called a magic eight ball before. I love that. Because <laughs> it's like, no, you shouldn't. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> So, um, I, and that's one of the things I like to empower people to do is that, and in my cooking classes that I do, because I do online cooking classes as well, is at least one recipe I try to develop in the class and write up afterwards. Oh, wow. So that, so that's kind of like a little treat for your, for your students, because they don't know pretty much what you're going to cook that day then, right? There is some of that too. Yeah. And I kind of like it because it's like, it makes it like a fun magic show. <laughs> but then also, because one of the things I think is so important um, is empowering people that it's okay to make mistakes and teach them how to get out of those mistakes. So I'm actually glad if I'm doing an instant pot class and beans are dry beans are the variable. So when your black beans took longer one time than another, it's not your fault. Just let me assure you. Mm -hmm. it, you don't know, even if you saw them put it out on the store while you got it, you don't know how long it was in the warehouse. You don't know when they were picked. Sometimes even the growing conditions can change that. So mm -hmm. I get excited if I'm cooking some beans and I open it up and they're not done. So I teach people. And actually what I do right here is I, and this is a good way to test it. It's just, Put one bean between two spoons and just go like that. If it breaks in half and it looks like two separate mini beans, it's probably not done and it'll make your tummy hurt. Um, but you slick in, maybe throw a little extra water in there and you cook them for five or 10 more minutes and life doesn't stop. You don't have, yeah, I've heard so many tales of like the beans just wouldn't cook. So I just threw them out because I didn't know what to do with them and it makes my heart ache. Um, and so I like it when things go wrong and maybe one of my favorite go wrong stories that I shouldn't be telling quite this much is <laughs> 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 telling stories on my own self. Um, cause when I do it, I usually do four or five recipes. So I could have a lot of things going on. I was making a gravy and I was doing something else and my, my, like, my gravy was lumpy. And I was like, first I'm like, Oh, I'm a bad person. My gravy is lumpy, just like every other human being. But then I was like, 
okay, if someone in class had brought this gravy to me, what would I tell them to do? And I'm like, throw it in the blender. I've never done that before. I'm like, so I'm going to throw it in the blender. It worked. And I'm like, now no one ever has to worry about having lumpy gravy again. If you forget or whatever, we have a solution. Wow. <laughs> throw it in the blender. I would have never thought about throwing gravy in the blender. Wow. <laughs> and if it would have been me by myself, I wouldn't have either. And so for me, if I'm working with somebody else, then I think, how can I calm them down? And what can I do? that's the easiest solution for them. So it's like, I always say, sometimes I need a me for me. I need to find someone who can fix my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know what? <laughs> so let's take see. us through one of your cooking classes. How many people are normally online cooking with you? Um, it can vary anywhere from like five or eight to about 15 people. They have the access to the replay too. So they can choose to watch it, to watch it live and ask questions during the live. Cause I'm super interactive. Um, and I like for them to take the class where it needs to go sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, but usually I have most of the things prepped. And I'm trying to think, so the class that's coming up on Saturday, we're going to be doing kind of like a Carolina barbecue. Mm. So I'm going to make like a vinegar based uh, sauce and we're going to use something called soy curls, which looks a lot like TVP, but it's just like non GMO soybeans that have been squished and extruded, but they, when you um, rehydrate them, they look like little chicken strips. Hmm. And there's nothing bad in them and they don't taste like much. But what I do is I put those in a slow cooker with the sauce dry. So I don't rehydrate them and it soaks up all the sauce. Yes. Wow. And that tastes like Carolina barbecue. Well, I, I just can't get over a soybeans tasting like Carolina barbecue. I mean, that's just. <laughs> I, it's all about the flavors because like since I went um, vegetarian meatless so young, I think when you're in your 20s, you don't get that nostalgic cravings as much. But when you start to get in your 30s, then you really do get these nostalgic cravings. And I realized it wasn't the pork that I was missing, but it was those flavors of the sauce, the vinegar, the tangy, you know. And so I do a lot with making um homemade sauces and I make my own spice blends, which is super easy to do. It sounds fancy, but you just need get an extra um, coffee grinder from the thrift store, throw some stuff in there. <laughs> You're good to go. So, so I think it's the flavorfulness of things like, I, and, and again, I'm not trying to tell you or anybody else why you like bacon, but I do find that if I get something smoky and salty, that works for that. And I have mm -hmm. sometimes four or five different kinds of liquid smoke. To me, that's the Southern vegan kit right there. So you got hickory and mesquite and applewood and pecan smoke. And so that can create a lot of those um, grilling barbecue memories. Like if I make, I call them homestyle beans. Since you're from North Carolina, you understand, but they're not like the red beans or Creole beans. <laughs> but they're cooked down and they're usually cooked down with fat back. Mm -hmm. So if you add, you know, some salt, I usually add something called nutritional yeast, which is, it's not like brewer's yeast. So don't ever put brewer's yeast in your food because it's nasty. <laughs> These are like little yellow flakes of happiness and they smell good. And um, they add uh, some umami flavor. So a lot of meat at, is umami. That's kind of, I think of it as that darker, richer flavor that builds things on and you can also add mushroom powder hmm. and i make mushroom powder so i go to the asian market because you can get mushrooms nice mushrooms cheap at the asian market and if if anybody's near durham Li ming's is great um and their um shiitake mushrooms were ginormous so the stems were too tough so i just cut off the stems dehydrated them and ground them up and the spice grinder, <laughs> but it was, you know, mushroom powder can cost $10 for a little bottle mm -hmm. sometimes, but this was free, like really free. <laughs> um, and, 
and I also then put some liquid smoke in there because I think that adds that extra thing. So if you do just a couple things like that, then you don't really notice. And I cook my beans down just a little extra so they get creamy without it being the fat that's mm -hmm. making them creamy. So yeah. uh, hopefully that gives you a little example of how you can still bring those flavors. Yeah, it does. Definitely. So why did you decide to start doing online classes to teach people how to cook like that? Is it something that you just decided, Hey, you know, I get so much joy from cooking. I want to share it with others. Or did people just come to you and say, I need a recipe for this, this, and this. And you just decided to share. Well, I think I wanted to do them. I had done a few in-person cooking classes and I've done some stuff at the library and I enjoy doing things in the library because I feel like that's helpful to people who don't necessarily get access. But I really hate bringing three Instant Pots and two coolers of food and trying to clean up my immersion blender in the bathroom sink before it hards on forever. Mm -hmm. So it'll take time to prep, time to pack up, time to pack up the car, time to unload the car, time to set up, you know, and then do it all over again. And if I'm in my house, my dishwasher is just right back there, mm -hmm. right? And so it saves me a lot of time. And I find that um, I can make the same amount of money as teaching a private class out. And I can reach people all over the country instead of people who are just local. Because uh, even with both my blogs and the cookbooks, I mean, I'm always developing new recipes. And lately I've been doing like hip things like reels and TikTok. That was my thing in February. <laughs> and so I'm making recipes on there too, or taking my immersion blender and put it in my natural peanut butter to mix that oil back in. Um, so I'm always doing something. So I decided to kind of give it a try. And then actually last March, which was really bad timing, I started Kathy's Cooking Club. Um, which is a way you can, because I teach two classes a month and it's a way to go ahead and just be enrolled. Some mm -hmm. people are like, I'm really tired A of waiting for me to get the classes listed. So there is one woman, Joanne, who is my favorite. And I swear I'd have that up two seconds and she will have bought it. And she's <laughs> like, please just let me not have to do this. And, um, and with the pandemic, I also tried to reach out and help people. So for a couple months I gave out free free classes too. And I usually have reduced and a, a couple of scholarships available for each one because I think it's important, especially now, it's, it's important all the time that everyone gets a chance, you know, to try something new if that's what they want to do. Um, and plus, I just actually, <laughs> it was like a month ago, I went live on YouTube with my class instead of unlisted so that was I had a lot of people that time <laughs> <laughs> and the irony is that some people bought classes after that <laughs> well you know every once in a while it doesn't hurt to kind of hey give this for free this is what you've got you know for free if you really like it then you know what some more classes here you go so you did a marketing job without even realizing you were marketing yourself so hey <laughs> it, yeah it was pretty funny because I had that since this year started I haven't gone live as much I do try to go live in my Facebook pages and group and YouTube channel um so I'm just to connect with my community like I feel like that's the there's some good things that have come out of the pandemic in addition to the tsunami of really not good things like the stress level I personally am at and I think a lot of people are at is hard but um I went live every day for several months and we did things like chop and chats I just did a chop and chat when I got my mushrooms I'm like I'm gonna chop my mushrooms and put them in the freezer you want to hang out and chat with me and we I talked about it. yeah and it it creates really good things it also gives me a lot of great information because I really didn't know that many people didn't know they can make their own mushroom powder. See, I didn't know that either. So, wow. Cause I mean, spices are expensive when you go to the store and buy them. They're, their mama's more expensive than the meat themselves or anything, anything you buy in the recipe, it's more expensive. 
It, it's true. And you know, I don't know if you know this, but regular supermarkets mark up their spices a thousand percent. It's more than the beer and wine. Mm -hmm. Wow. And some great things, because I know you do some bargain stuff, mm -hmm. which I, I'm definitely like, I'm a thrift store gal. I love everything in the thrift store, plus the hunt. But um, to get some really good stuff, like if you only want a teaspoon or two, and I know it's harder when you live kind of out, if you mm -hmm. live out farther, but if, if you're near like a co-op, a food co-op is usually kind of, you might think of it as a crunchy granola place, but they usually have spices in jars and you can get like a teaspoon or a tablespoon so that you can try that weird spice and not spend $20 on it. Mm -hmm. And then once you know you like it, drive into town or get this on Amazon. I Indian spices mm. are so less expensive. And like you can get a bag of cumin like this for like $8. Wow. Right. And that little jar might cost you six. Yeah. Okay. We have a, a, a Comment. It says, Kathy, we all think that we are your favorites, but I would argue that Marilyn should be included with Joanna's part of your favorites. <laughs> and Linda, you're one of my favorites too. And I'm not just saying that. Um, and Marilyn is amazing. She is a woman in Louisiana that is the dehydrating queen. So whatever I'm dehydrating, I still need to pay homage to Marilyn who like, she's like, I think I can dehydrate vegetable broth. Like she comes up with all these things and she does. Wow. She does it all. Yeah. No, and she, she's very much, um, she has a garden and she preps everything. Like she's fantastic and an inspiration to me. And she takes your classes. <laughs> I <laughs> that is so cool that someone just takes your classes as an inspiration to you. I really, I love that. And it means you have a community that fosters learning among each other as well. I love that. Well, I love it because when I go on classes, so it's a lot like this. So there's comments coming down the side um, when I'm doing classes too. So I get to see everybody. And what I love now is that everybody starts talking amongst themselves before I get on. So Linda and Joanne and Marilyn and, you know, a handful of others are already talking about the weather and how things are, you know, and as you know, from going live on Facebook, sometimes you don't get to see everybody's names depending on where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. And 70% of the time I can guess by either where they're from or one thing that they say who they are. And I love it. I really do. Now let's talk about the gluten free because I know a lot of my viewers are gluten free. So our listeners as well. How do you how do you navigate that? Because it's so hard to find things, especially in grocery stores and stuff that are gluten free. How do you navigate it? It, it can be. It's getting better. And actually, I'm trying to see if I can find one thing because there's actually uh, I'll, I'll follow up with you on it because I don't okay. think I see it right here. There's actually. Um, a gluten, I think it's nourished online and it's like a little gluten free fair that used to be in pop in, in where you go to it. Now it's going to be virtual, so you can find a bunch of stuff and it's not all vegan, so it would be good for everyone. Um, it hidden gluten can be hard, and one of the things about being vegan that I miss is that there's something called Satan, not Satan. But say tan, <laughs> I promise you, I'm not taking you down the wrong path. <laughs> and it's a, a wheat meat that's actually thousands of years old from China. And so if anybody watches TikTok, see, now that I started, I watch the TikTok. And so a young friend of mine sent me this. Have you seen this? This is amazing. You can make meat from flour. And I was like, so they you take the flour and the water and you mix it and you rinse it under the water to remove everything but the gluten. And it's this big pit and it looks meaty and you can fry mm -hmm. it. But that's how they made gluten in the 70s, which is mm -hmm. funny. We have vital wheat gluten now that we mix with our broth. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to not rinse for 40 minutes. Um, but so I miss that because that's in a lot of the different um, things that you find like tofurkey 
you know, things that everybody's kind of familiar with or like Morningstar Farms. Um, so it, plant-based products are really good about labeling gluten-free if they're gluten-free. And so things like Beyond Meat, Impossible Burgers, if people are kind of trying those out, those are gluten-free. Um, what a vegan hot dog that used to be gluten free just added gluten to it like has been gluten free for 10 years why i have no idea but now we all and i i went and looked the pack i have has gluten in it wow yeah um so I, it's not as hard like because like something like soy curls and we can't buy soy curls in North Carolina. We have to use Amazon. It's actually by Butler Foods in the Pacific Northwest. And I'm not even sponsored by them. I just love them. <laughs> I'm not sponsored by them. <laughs> I know. But I could be if you want to come get me. I'm here. <laughs> um, but what's kind of nice is they're, they're shelf stable, though, like anything that's a whole food, it's a little better if you're going to keep them a long time in the freezer. Mm -hmm. But you can make anything like you can um, chop them up or break them up and make kind of like ground meat things or they can go in dishes really easily and they're, they are gluten free. So that's that's one of the only things. Um, the other thing about being gluten free and vegan is that most easily attainable gluten-free breads have eggs in them. Mm. And so you get kind of in a, in a thing. Sprouts is a really good place. I think it's Canyon Bakehouse. I'm either telling you the one that has the eggs or the one that doesn't. I can't remember off the top of my head, but it says vegan on it mm -hmm. and their stuff is good, but it's, it's, it's very expensive. So like four hot dog buns might be six or seven dollars. Wow. Yeah. So and but you know, it's not that hard to make things yourself either. And you can that, find recipes online. That's what I was going to bring up next question is making things yourself was probably cheaper. But we do have a Comment, another comment from Linda says, if you order directly from Butler Foods, they send you samples in your package. Yum. So They have a chicken, chicken seasoning. Oh, cool. <laughs> so let's break it down to, you know, is it cheaper? Definitely cheaper to make it yourself and explore mm -hmm. new recipes than to go out and buy the prepackaged stuff? Absolutely. Um, and what you'll find is that you'll probably be making an investment in flowers to begin with. Now, that's not to say that you can't get white rice flour, maybe some flaxseed or psyllium husk. There's going to be some stuff you got to learn about. I'm still learning about some of the baking things. Um, or you can get some mixes. So, like, if you, were, if you needed to cook gluten-free and you want to try making some stuff yourself to use in your older recipes, I would suggest Bob's red mill one-to-one -one. do not get bob's red mill regular gluten-free flour blend it has a high chickpea flour in it which means if you were going to make raw cookie dough it's going to taste gross the other one is more rice flour mm -hmm. sorghum and things like that which is going to taste good um I love me some Indian food. And so like things like pakoras, which are like shredded vegetables with a coating with chickpea flour and spices and then fried. Or I air fry mine. Um, makes a beautiful flavor, but especially if raw chickpea flour is nasty. It's just <laughs> nasty. So <laughs> there's some things I don't, I'm usually like taste everything as you go, you know, is that enough cinnamon for you? But I'm like, if there's chickpea flour in there, you just smell it. You just smell it and go along till it's done. <laughs> but, but yeah, and Bob's Fred Mill is not always the most affordable. Like if you got to see all the flowers, mm -hmm. but um, I did uh, a party and I made, all kinds of things. And I just took regular recipes and just substituted it one to one. And so it was an easy way to go the first year that I was um, gluten free. 
and it's still cheaper than buying gluten-free ready-made products because even the ones that have egg in it, they can still be six or seven dollars a loaf. Wow. Now I have to ask you because you're a chef or you cook, has there ever been a recipe that you've tried and you're like, no, this is not going straight in the trash can. This is not good at all. <laughs> oh yeah. you. And I will say this to everyone. So even if you're not, if you're just starting to cook or maybe you're having to cook more because of your budget, you know, just remember whatever you make, even if it's not perfect, it's probably still just as good as the spaghetti and bottled sauce you would have eaten as a default. So give yourself some grace there. I am queen of like, they say I shouldn't do this. Let me see what happens. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I always say I make those mistakes so you don't have to. But really, I can't help it. I'm like, <laughs> so I, I did get a bee in my bonnet. And I decided I wanted, because I do a big Halloween party. And so I wanted to make black pasta. So I decided I was going to cook for Ben rice, which is just black rice. It's actually a whole grain rice that's delicious and spooky too. So mm. if you guys get a hold of that. Um, and so instead of being like a smart human being and grinding it in a spice grinder, like one would think I would, you probably thought I was going there, didn't you? Yeah, no, mm -hmm. no, I cooked that stuff up. And then I decided I was going to put it in my little food processor and just puree it and add flour until it became a dough. Well, that doesn't happen. So <laughs> let me assure you that does not happen at all. And there's a reason nobody else has ever done it before because it's a bad idea. <laughs> And so this was a little, and you know how they have the little teeny tiny blades, right? And so up, and there's a hole in there. Well, that stuff is all up in the hole, stuck. And so I had to like stick it in a planter and soak it in water for like probably three weeks and get a little brush, get a little more out, <laughs> get some more. So, oh yeah. And the other best story I have about a disaster was not really a disaster exactly. So when I um, was doing the vegan slow cooker book, I was working a full-time job and we lived in a smaller house than we have now. So it was just like an 1100 square foot house. And I had four slow cookers going because I only had three months to do 120 recipes. Mm -hmm. So it was very exciting. <laughs> Daredevil time. So I had put in, not thinking this out, I think I had an Indian dish, a Mexican dish, an Asian dish and something like chili. And I walked in that house and it smelled disgusting. I can imagine those flavors oh. together. Oh. And so we packed all of it up and put it in the fridge and we went out to eat like grown up people do because, because <laughs> it wasn't the food itself that was bad, but all of that together was just like, <laughs> But, you know, everything else made the grade. So when, when I'm doing a, developing a recipe, so like maybe the first time all the flavors and things aren't right. So if, if somebody out there is experimenting or maybe you're maybe you're using one of my recipes for the first time or somebody else's, I may not make it exactly the way you like it. So if you're in the slow cooker instant pot on your stove, I don't care what before you serve that taste it. And it's okay to add more seasonings. I leave out like the clump of things that I used so that I can go and put some things back in, especially if you're slow cooking or you're cooking in an instant pot. Um, the high pressure or the long cooking times can degrade some of the spices, and especially the herbs will almost always need to go back in. But I'm, I'm not scared to add a little bit more grated ginger in there and let it cook for five more minutes. You know, so because I don't know about you, I, if you're frugal, I'm assuming you've used the slow cooker at, at a time or two. Yes, I actually have a uh, soup on in my Instapot on slow cook right now. So <laughs> already for dinner. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. And I love to do I do that sometimes, too, because especially if I know I'm going to have a crazy day. It's so nice. But I always get a little bit miffed when people are like. I hate the slow cooker. Everything tastes the same out of the slow cooker. It's your fault. Mm -hmm. 
and I don't mean it in a mean way. You, you just don't know, but it, you would never just taste something on top of the stove and go, this doesn't taste really great, but I guess we'll eat it. Right. Yeah. No, you would never do that. Um, and so I think if you get kind of used to doing that and also then if it's maybe you made my recipe and maybe you're like, this is not enough garlic flavor for me. Then what I wouldn't do is put in fresh garlic, but garlic powder, onion powder, they're amazing and they're all natural ingredients. Some people think that because it comes out like that, it's a chemical. Mm -hmm. But you can literally slice onion and garlic and put it in your dehydrator, and grind it up in a spice grinder. So it's 100% it's natural. And do you use that a lot when you do slow cooking? Um, so, so, because we're not big garlic people in our house. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't like the taste of garlic, but I'd use a lot of onion powder in my house. Yeah. Uh, it can be a lifesaver because like in my first book, I had said to a lot of, you know, saute up your onions and then put it in the slow cooker. And I didn't know how angry people got when you said that to them, which is real angry. <laughs> so if you go and look at, at the reviews for that book, there's a lot of, she wants you to cook before you even put anything in. This is too much work. And so I, in the second slow cooker book I did is I actually made a batch of onions you cook in the slow cooker really long and put in the freezer. But, mm -hmm. but you can, all, if you don't feel like cutting up onions and you're making something on the stove that calls for it, onion powder. Yep. Slow cooker. I love the onion powder. So you were just talking about having four slow cookers on at one time to make all those recipes. How many appliances do you have in your house? Oh my God. You want all the appliances? Yeah. Like, okay. At one point I had 12 slow cookers, but Whoa. I think I only have six, five or six now, but I have five or six instant pots and I have three air fryers right now. I've had as many as five, but when I'm doing a book, uh -huh. I kind of need to, so I've done two instant pot books and I've done an air fryer book. And like the, this guy behind here is the um, Breville oven air and it's like a toaster oven, but then the other ones are like an egg. So you kind of have, egg shape you have to kind of figure out which one is which and our timings for both so i have a ridiculous amount of appliances like i have them scattered around the dining room on the floor <laughs> and we have cabinets in the basement full of them my favorite slow cooker that i only pull out is like it's this old hamilton beach one and it's a pumpkin and it's cast iron and I pull that out for my party. I have a snowflake one for Coco. Like it's, uh, I have a Hello Kitty one, but the rest ones are real. You know, but I, I have never even cooked in that Hello Kitty one. I'm sure it doesn't cook well. And just in case anyone thinks I'm recommending it. <laughs> but, but, you know, I like having um, a one quart to two quart because they used to make one and a half quarts. Now they make two quarts and they're smaller and those are great for oatmeal or desserts. And um, if you use oil, you can just put a spritz of oil in there, put your steel cut oats. I don't recommend doing rolled oats, but steel cut oats in there with water and go to sleep. And then you wake up and you have oatmeal ready. That's a cheap yeah. meal. Yeah, that is a cheap meal. Super cheap. So what are your favorite kitchen gadgets then? <sighs> Besides the coffee grinder that you got. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll tell you my real favorite one. And we talk about, so I have a spice grinder attachment that goes on my Ninja blender. And that is like, and it goes in and out of stock, but it's one of my favorite things. Cause then it has the power of the Ninja blender behind it. Because, and I know that sounds silly. So, um, and I love my Instant Pots too. I mean, I probably use the air fryer and the Instant Pot both or one every single day. And I use my spice grinder several times a month for either making a new blend. Like I need to make my dry bullion. You know, so I use nutritional yeast that we talked about and nutritional yeast is kind of like this chameleon it kind of can make you can use it on pasta and make a cheesy sauce but if you put it in soups it kind of gives it a chickeny flavor 
And then I put a little kind of poultry spice in there, you know, a little bit of sage, rosemary, thyme. And I just throw that in soups and stews. But I blend, you could just mix it together. But if you blend it together and grind it really well, it incorporates and disperses better. So you get a really nice flavor out of it. So that's why I really love the, the spice grinder. Um, I'm trying to, th it's hard. It's like talking about my babies. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what book do you like best? And now I just go, oh, the one I last wrote. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> you, you know, but, and we, I did treat myself last year at my birthday. And so I got one of those Cuisinart ice cream makers with the compressors. Mm -hmm. So Cheryl's mama bought it for me is really what happened because <laughs> I could not ever justify that. And that's, kind of, that's my fun new thing as it's getting warm. I'm trying to think about some cool ice creamy things I can make. And I did find a Yo Nana. Have you seen commercials for those where you put the frozen fruit in? It's tall and you put the frozen fruit in and you smoosh it in with this thing like you do the blender and it comes out kind of grated and you mix it together and it gets all smooth. So you can, and you could also do the same thing in your food processor with frozen bananas you cut up in case anybody was like, let's see, I paid $10 for my Yonana. So I feel no guilt. <laughs> I feel no guilt. But if I had paid two hundred dollars for my Yonana, now that's another story. There's no many. There's not that many bananas I can eat to make up for a two hundred dollar banana appliance. You know. Yeah, that would be kind of stretching it a little bit, unless you had a really big family. <laughs> yeah, and it's just me and Cheryl. The dog is not having the banana ice cream. We're just not going there. But. Um, but like in, if anybody's interested in ever doing that too, if your bananas are getting overripe or if you had too many saved for banana bread and you're like, what am I going to do? Cut them into just like slices, frozen, throw them in a food processor with a little S blade, maybe put, um, let's say for three to four bananas, maybe you'll put a half a teaspoon to a teaspoon of vanilla in there. And just enough, um, I say non-dairy milk. It could be whatever you want it to be. Honestly, you could make it, you could put a little rum in there and get it to blend. I don't care. That would be delicious too. <laughs> it, pro <sounds> good. <laughs> <laughs> it probably would be a tablespoon or two tablespoons. I mean, obviously don't give it to the kids. It would be more than vanilla extract would be. But if you wanted to make an adult dessert, or you could just throw a little bit of, um, you know, I usually use soy milk or almond milk, but really anything would work. And just to get it blending good and you're going to scrape it down and it looks like soft serve ice cream. Exactly. Yummy. Yeah. So what is up next for you? <sighs> um, a couple of things. So I got a class on Saturday. We talked about that. I've been doing some more stuff on Clubhouse. I don't know if you guys know about Clubhouse or your, um, but it's a new audio only social media. It's not, it's kind of like a in between of a conference walking down the halls and picking rooms you want to go into and an interactive podcast. So I've been, I'm trying to schedule a room every day between now and the end of the month, Monday through Friday to talk vegan stuff. I also do, I I'm, teach people how to do live video with their business like I've learned how to do with my classes and things. So we do rooms there on that. So that's one. That's my play thing right now. Your play thing. I love that. <laughs> I have to always learn something new. And I am working on a new book that's going to be self-published, which will be my very first big self-publishing thing. And it's going to be on um sauces and dressings and dips and spice blends because people I have um in all my cookbooks in the front I have a staple section mm -hmm. so people ask for my spice blends a lot like I have one that tastes like wise barbecue potato chips Ooh, that's 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 my Achilles heels wise barbecue potato chips <sighs> I could eat a whole bag of them in one sitting I'd love that Oh my gosh. Yeah, I know. And that's how I made my very first tomato powder was just to make that recipe. Mm. And you can, if 
I don't like those little cherry tomatoes. I want to, but I don't. And I cut them in half and I dehydrate them and then I grind them in my spice grinder. <laughs> <laughs> That's my thread. If I had kids, don't make me get out the spice grinder. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so I'm doing because I do a lot of that. I do a lot of things that um, are specifically for the people in the in in like kind of the health vein or the whole food plant based community. So a lot of times I have options for things for salt free or oil free if that's part of what you do. So kind of my whole thing is, Melissa, if you came to me and you're like, I use oil and salt and I want to make this recipe, I can make it where it uses oil and salt. But a lot of times I'll just have options. So I might say things like saute in a, a tablespoon of olive oil or water saute. Mm. So that that way everybody can use it to what feels best for them. Yeah. Yeah. So basically your your recipes can be adaptable. Yeah, I'm all about the options. And if you if you wanted to make one of my recipes and you didn't have certain spices, a lot of them I could give you options for. Same thing, um, I have some people who can't eat anything with tomatoes. And so we work on some options for that. And for me, it's like I get to have my own game show. Like, I love that stuff. Love Your it. own game show. I love that. <laughs> you know, I'll take without tomatoes for 100 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking that same thing. <laughs> We're feeling each other. I like this. I'm having a great time. <laughs> so tell us what your websites are called again. Absolutely. So if you have an instant pot, plant-based instant pot.com is um, all vegan, all instant pot recipes. There may be a spice recipe. I'm, I'm wildly like that. Um, healthy slow cooking.com is the other one, which you would think after what I just said is all slow cooking, but no, there's air fryer recipes. There's some instant pot recipes, stove top, stove, and slow cooker recipes. So it's it's a 12 year old blog is what it is. And it's it's a big move to move um, a domain name. But Healthy Slow Cooking does have all vegan food. Some of the older recipes may not have all the oil free or salt free options, but all you have to do is um, put a comment or send me an email and ask a question and I'm happy to help you make those where you can have them too. And my classes are at kathyhester.podia, P-O-D-I-A.com. And that's where you can join Kathy's Cooking Club and get two classes a month. Or you can purchase them um, separately if you want to. Uh, and right now, I'm trying something new. So these two new classes come. Usually my classes are $35 each. Um, but the barbecue class that's coming up this Saturday at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time is $25 if you buy it now. And then the class two weeks after that, whose date I don't know, but it is on the website. We're going to do like mez platter meat. So mez platter, I know you guys have seen it. It's like when you see all the hummuses and the baba mm -hmm. ganish and the beautiful vegetables and pita breads. So last time we did like almond labna and mahamara and dill pickle hummus, in case you thought I was getting a little too fancy. Uh, <laughs> we keep it all in the middle. Nothing, nothing's too fancy for you anyhow, whoever's listening. Don't listen to that voice. But and I made plain, so we made hummus and we actually made two flavors out of it. So, and stuff like that can go in the freezer. So this time we're gonna make like, faux meats, but not faux meats, like impossible meats, but we're going to make like falafels and shawarma and all those strong, beautiful flavors, but we're just going to put them in with vegetables and plant-based, maybe some chickpeas. I'm still, I'm experimenting with the kippy, <laughs> but I'm going towards a mushroom kind of brown rice mixture that we're going to put in those little triangles and put in the air fryer to get that good crispy coating on the, the edges. So mm -hmm. while it won't be like, oh, you could give this to your husband and he'd be like, oh, this is wonderful meat, honey. 
but he, he would be like, oh, these are really nice flavors. So just know that. Um, and that's what's coming up. So those two classes are marked down to $25 with no coupon. They will probably be marked up after I do the classes. But if you shoot me an email and say you saw this here, chances are good that I will cave and give you a code. <laughs> I love that you will cave. <laughs> You know how they always say, you know, have that timer running out and have it, you know, I'm just, I just, you know, we're, we're the people who we see the dog loose and we bring them, we put them in our car and try to find the owner. Mm. <laughs> that's, that's my youngest daughter. Total. I'm like, why are you picking up a strange dog? Because it's got a collar and needs home. I'm like, okay, whatever. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. So now you, you understand me. I think that was totally that's awesome. you, yeah. but everybody's welcome. And if you're new, it's okay. And you can even if you can't take the classes live, or if you take an older class, or you run across something, and it doesn't make sense to you, please ask me. Because at some point in their lives, everyone didn't know where to find nutritional yeast in the store. Mm. You know, so they're Everything's okay. We'll figure it out all together. And I'm here to help. I love how open you are. You're like, please ask, please email me if you want me to tweak the recipe a little bit or options of something you can't have. I love that because a lot of people are like, no, you have to cook it the way or you just don't cook this recipe. And the fact that you're open to say, hey, you know what? If it doesn't work for you, let's work it to see how it will work for you instead. So I love that. It, it's important and it's really like, there are just a few things that are different between me and my brand, but both are very inclusive. Like I'm back in the day when you could go places, I'm the person who would invite people. So like if I was at a conference and I saw some, I ha had friends there and they didn't, I'm going to invite them to come along with us. And, you know, I think recipes and teaching classes and, you know, being a blogger is no different. It, it really is inviting people to come along with us. Yep. That is so true. And on that note, I thank you for coming along with me today and sharing your amazing gifts. Uh, actually, I would love for you if you want to come back on and maybe do a demonstration, maybe coming in maybe April, May, June, do something like. Oh, yeah. Uh, barbecue cooking something so people can like see because when you think summer, you think barbecue, you think all the meats. But sometimes you can't have all the meat. So you maybe could do a vegan like barbecue for us, maybe? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like there's, I even make these great ribs out of that, that wheat gluten powder stuff that we were talking about. I could show you how to do that. I have a multi camera setup. So I can come in through Ecamm, even through StreamYard, and do that so you can see overhead views and everything. Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah. So, yeah, I would love to have you back on. This, this has been such a fun chat. I know. Now I just wish we could like go hang out and take a walk after. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me about it. It's like COVID has really got a lot of people like in the house. So it's a beautiful day, at least where I am in Durham. I think it is okay where you are too. I think yeah, it's going to be yeah, 70. It's yeah. It's beautiful. So, well, awesome. I am so thankful that you invited me on. It's been such a pleasure chatting with you and getting to know with you. All right, guys. Thank you so much, Kathy, again. And I can't wait to have you back on. And guys, we will see you on the next chat from the blog cabin. Bye.